as the 1820s, Cincinnati, Ohio had a diverse population of immigrant residents. By the 1860s, Cincinnati became the sixth largest city in America at the time, being home to around 160,000 people. In the next few decades, African Americans began to migrate north to Cincinnati due to its proximity to the Ohio River. This new population congregated in the space between the areas of Central Avenue and Mill Creek, which eventually became known as the West End of Cincinnati. When the area formed, it was populated by different classes and races of people, with African Americans and people on lower class habitating close to the river and Irish immigrants and middle class citizens living on the upper end. The dramatic increase to the population of this area led to a growing industrial development. Factories and businesses rapidly began appearing. As a result, the West End became the most densely populated area of Cincinnati by 1870. The Kenyon Bar Urban Redevelopment Plan targeted and destroyed the African American community and there are lasting and visible repercussions that are present in Cincinnati to this day. Because of the rapid pace at which the West End grew, the population of the area was diverse among race, ethnicity, and class. But because of the pressure to find housing and competition in the job market, tension arose between the differing groups and race riots broke out. The Lower West End began losing its factories and commercial establishments. After the upper class white residents moved out, middle class white residents took over the upper end of the West End, while African Americans and new Eastern European immigrants filled the spaces in the lower end. In the century, the tenement housing began to decline due to overcrowding and loss of thriving businesses in the area, so the West End started to take on the characteristics of a slum. The high concentration tenement housing was some of the cheapest available in the city and it was close distance from factory jobs that would be some people's only option for employment, so the area attracted residents. The racial composition of the city also drastically changed within these decades, and by 1930, 11% of the city was black. The West End neighborhood was filled with new residents who couldn't afford to live anywhere in Cincinnati or who were too poor to move out. The poorer residents tended to live on the lower end and the wealthier and white people remained on the upper end or moved out if they were financially able to. In the 1920s, this was the largest black community of Cincinnati and it began to thrive culturally, religiously, and socially because of the attempts to lift up and celebrate the black population. Organizations such as the NAACP, the Negro Civic Welfare Association, and others tried to improve housing, health conditions, and other social issues for black members of the community. On the opposite end of the spectrum, white residents of the area had concerns for their own well-being in the community and wanted to improve the racial status of their community. The Ku Klux Klan became active in the 1920s. Despite race, there were outside forces working against the residents of the West End, such as real estate brokers, landlords, and businessmen who wanted to convert housing into new economic opportunities for themselves. The influence of these people resulted in the area becoming a ghetto, slum, and eventually a designated blighted area. The neighborhood of the West End attracted lower class residents because of its proximity to jobs and cheap housing, but it trapped the residents in an inescapable cycle. The people who were motivated to live there because of the work were stuck as laborers and couldn't improve their employment status. This mainly consisted of black residents, being that by 1930, 70% of the city's black population lived in the West End, and 90% of that population lived in the Lower End. They were also trapped because financial institutions didn't allow them to borrow money for housing and were not allowed to purchase homes in white neighborhoods. Because developers knew the average income of the people, they didn't think they could make a good profit, so no new housing was built, which led to more overcrowding and brought in landlords that exploited the vulnerability of the residents. The housing area became smaller and smaller to fit more people, and the quality of the housing kept declining because the landlords didn't care enough to maintain it. The deterioration of the area was not by coincidence. The city officials encouraged this behavior by landlords because they wanted a reason to have the areas raised and be used for other forms for profit. Public officials did not think of the residents of this area as their responsibility and did not try to create alternative, alternative low-income housing for them to live in. The housing in the West End became unsafe to live in because of how unsanitary it was and disease spread rapidly, but it was not seen as a real concern by the city. The public opinion of the West End was that it was filled with crime, disease, and decay, so it arose as a concern of the city to somehow fix the area. The city was more concerned about the wants, needs, and concerns of the people in the surrounding neighborhoods rather than the residents of the West End. 
1924, the first Zoning Act of the city was passed in attempts to regulate the housing and health of the West End. When creating the city plan, the displacement of residents was not considered. The goal of the city was to transform the neighborhood from a slum to a commercial district. The housing of the people would be left up to private housing, but it was found that this was not realistic because the people living there had little to no income, so it was thought that the government should take control over raising the slums and creating affordable housing. In November of 1933, the first proposal for money for this project was sent, and by 1934, the specific blocks were chosen that would be redeveloped first. Residents of these blocks pushed back and questioned why they were chosen, because they were not in the worst conditions out of the entire neighborhood. Residents thought that they wanted this area cleared first because it surrounded the recently constructed U Union Terminal. In February of 1936, the initial construction began by creating Laurel Homes, the first public housing project in Cincinnati. It was decided that the slum clearance would be for white people only, so the black community called for the ability to reside in Laurel Homes because at the time, they were only allowed access to Lincoln Park. By 1938, residents began moving into Laurel Homes, and by 1942, residents began moving into Lincoln Park. After the construction of these two public housing arrangements, the neighborhood was a completely different space, and there were 82 new apartment buildings described as self-contained superblocks. While the new housing offered better living conditions, they did not make up for as much housing as they demolished. It is estimated that around 3,000 black families were displaced, and there were only about 1,300 that received residence in Laurel Homes or Lincoln Park. A new plan was set in place that was similar to the 1933 redevelopment plan, but split the section into residential housing and business development because of the creation of the Mill Creek Expressway. The plan addressed the fact that it would be displacing a large number of people and wrote that low-income families need to find housing through existing places or new private construction. On November 22, 1948, the Cincinnati Metropolitan Master Plan was created and it deemed that around 19,000 out of the 21,000 of the West End's housing was deteriorated and decided to divide the designated area into two, one half being residential and the other being commercial with the expressway down the middle. The Federal Housing Act of 1949 gave the city grants and loans so that the blighted areas of the city could be cleared out and construction could begin. The city would have to characterize certain areas as blighted to be financed by the federal government so that the area could be condemned, raised, and rebuilt. In July of 1959, the master plan for the redevelopment of the Kenyon Bar Urban Renewable Area was published and the 296-acre area below the Mill Creek Expressway was to be used commercially and the area above the expressway was going to be used for residents. The section above the expressway was known as Queensgate 1 and the section below as Queengates 2. By 1965, the area of Queen Queensgate 1 no longer had houses and the land was being sold to potential businesses. Over the next decade, the land was sold for around $8 million and was completely finished by September of 1972. 2017, roughly 120 people live in the area called Queensgate and only a few of the original buildings still stand. Previous residents from the area were heartbroken from the destruction of their home and community. Author John Harshaw describes the West End before the redevelopment as the cultural epicenter of Cincinnati's black community and also a place to learn about others. The effects of the redevelopment still have the imp an impact on the city today. A study in 2011 said that Cincinnati is the 8th most segregated city in America, and a study from the Journal of New Geography states that Cincinnati ranks 50 out of 52 major U.S. cities when it comes to the economy for black residents. The West End has never fully recovered from the segregation and poor economic standing. Currently, it has the 5th lowest household income in Cincinnati, the annual median being 12000 As seen in Cincinnati today, the remnants of this redevelopment remain. The slums are gone, but the lives, culture, and the people that were essential to the neighborhood are gone. The people of this community, which was mainly Black Americans, were dismissed and their home was not taken into consideration in this development process. The West End still stands in Cincinnati, even though most parks are unrecognizable and do not have the same character they once held.